the final seven ayat of Surah Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives 12 characteristics of Ibad al-Rahman, those Ibad, those slaves of Allah. And if we haven't had the opportunity to have a look at Surah, Rahman, uh, Surah Furqan and look at these ayat, it might be an opportunity or it might be an idea to go back today and have a look at what those 12 characteristics are that Allah classes as Ibad al-Rahman. The last seven ayats of Surah Furqan, and we've got to have this uh, connection with Quran. You know, sometimes we come to university and we sort of forget at times, alhamdulillah, we have Ahl Bayt societies as well and you know, they, they keep alive the message of the Ahl Bayt at times, inshallah this one does. Um, and uh, you know, we, we sort of come to university, no one knows us, you know, um, we can do what we want, really. And really the only person watching is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the last thing on our mind when at university is our connection with the Quran because, you know, I lost that connection when I was doing my A-levels or my GCSEs because exam time came. Prior to that, I was praying Quran, I was reciting regularly, but then exam time came and the deen, the Quran and everything that I had sort of took a back seat and I started studying more for revision of my exams because that in my eyes was the more important factor and that I went forward to my A-levels and I thought, this is even harder, I don't have time to go to the masjid, I don't have time to obey the rules, the regulations of Islam, or I'm going to pray namaz, but I'm going to delay it a little bit. And the Quran, well, that definitely, then that got put on the back burner. Every now and then, Shahr Ramadan would come, and I think two weeks before Shahr Ramadan, those of you that have, you know, where everyone goes to the masjid and recites Quran, for hey, look, the Maulana, he's going to be heading up Quran Khani, right? And he's going to realize that I haven't recited the Holy Quran for a whole year. So the two weeks before Shahar Ramadan, full speed ahead, got to make my Quran more fluent. So I'm constantly practicing, practicing, practicing. And then I get to the masjid on the first night of Shahar Ramadan and it's as if I've been reciting Quran all year long and you know, my Quran is fluent. And as the month progresses, I think, oh, I'm getting, I'm getting the hang of this. I'm going to carry on after Shahr Ramadan, this is something that I'm going to continue. And I make that resolution by about the 15th of Shahr Ramadan. By about the 15th, I'm halfway through and I think, no, I'm going to make the resolution that I'm going to continue to read the Holy Quran throughout the year. Come the day of Eid, forget the Quran. Sometimes I even miss my Fajr. Yeah? I forget my Fajr and then I think, right, I will carry on reading the Quran just tomorrow. I'll start tomorrow, I'll start tomorrow, and then I fall back into the cycle. That was me prior to come to university. Then when I come to university, now there's definitely no one to ask me. Whether I go to masjid or not, doesn't really bother anyone. So, whether I read the Quran or not, doesn't, I've got no one to prove it. Because I don't have that love, that connection with the Holy Quran. So that connection needs to be continued because there's the hadith of the sixth of Imam Salih sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says every time you want to assess yourself, you want to take account of yourself, you use the Quran as a mirror. What is nafsaka ala kitab Allah? Use the the Quran as your mirror. Compare yourself to the the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See what the Quran says as the characteristics of the slave of Allah, of the one that is a true Muslim. Look towards the Holy Quran and then compare whether or not I am at that level. Whether or not I am really that Ibad al-Rahman. And as Surah Furqan gives those 12 characteristics right at the end, if we go back to where we were, right at the end of Surah uh, Furqan, in that last ayah, ayah 77, the ayah says, say, addressing the Holy Prophet, say to the people that my Lord would not care for you, 
Lawla du'a'ukum had it not been for your constant supplication towards him. Otherwise, he would not have cared for you. Allah cares for those people because of their du'a. And when we look at the importance of du'a, we see here, highlighted in the Holy Quran, then we find great urafa, great teachers of akhlaq, people like Aynama Tamatawai, no, philosophers, mystics, sages, Gnostics. Someone like Aynama Tamatawai, he's saying things like la wazna la wa la qadra la. When he says that the person who does not have that connection with dua, does not have that love of dua, does not constantly supplicate to Allah, la wazna la, la qadra la. He doesn't have any sort of station in front of Allah. He's not supplicating. Thus, he has no station in front of Allah. The importance of dua is this. It is helping us in our spiritual development. And when we look through the books of hadith, we find hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of hadith concerning dua, concerning supplication, and how one should supplicate, where to supplicate, how to supplicate. One of the interesting ones that we come across is one from uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where they say Rasulullah was leaving the masjid and he sees along the way that Shaitan is there. Shaitan is there. So, and this is a lengthy conversation. People have taken parts and bits of it and, and they've you know, presented it in various ways where Shaitan says there are certain things that I cannot bear when your followers, uh, when they do these certain things. And one of the things that he says to the uh, Holy Prophet is, do you know why I do not like the Abd that supplicates, the servant that supplicates towards Allah? He says, because at that time I become deaf, dumb and blind. I become weak. I'm unable to misguide them from the path because they have created that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether the hadith is sahih, whether it's da'if, either one. The mafhum, the, the actual uh, essence of the hadith, there's nothing wrong with it there. In fact, a lot of the teachers of uh, akhlaq, when they form, use this right, it's used, in fact, uh, by Ayyad al-Fi'i, who was a very uh, prominent teacher of akhlaq, in form. He gives this example as well. That you know, shaitan, when a person is supplicating to Allah, when he is in the habit of constant dua, he has shaitan constantly deaf, dumb, and blind in regards to trying to misguide him from the path. And this is very essential because we have to try and relate everything that we do within our lives, or we have to try and relate Islam to everything we do in our lives. What often happens is when we enter new facets of our life, when we enter into new avenues, new um, horizons uh, in our life, we tend to sort of try and, you know, Islam doesn't sort of fit in there. So we restrict Islam to the time when we go home on the musalla, when we're praying, or when we go to the masjid, and then everything else, my uh, life is non Islamic. Inshallah, slowly but surely, we develop um, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, develop that into our lives. So du'a appears many times throughout the Quran. Another one is um, where it's another prophetic hadith where it says that the Holy, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, addressed mankind and said to them, Sittatun minni wa sittatun minkum. There are seven things that are from me or seven things that I will do for you, but there are seven things that I require back from you. Yeah? So there's seven seven things. At Tawbatu Minkum. Tawbah asking for repentance is from you. 
Forgiveness is from me. This is Allah saying. Tawbah is from you. Repenting is from you. Asking for forgiveness is from me. Thanks is from you. And in return, sustenance is from me. Tawakkul, reliance is from you. Sufficiency in all the affairs of your life is from me. Ad-du'a minkum, supplication du'a is from you. Well, ijaba to minni, but its acceptance is from me. And the hadith continues, and there's two very interesting uh, parts. I was going to end it at that, but the other, the other two at the end are very interesting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A war is from me. A war is from me. I mean, the war, the, the, the jihad that we know, or whatever level. It says, war is from me, but sabr is from you. That is what is expected of you in the face of this. When I bring this, I expect sabr. Trials and calamities are from me. Pleasure and satisfaction in the divine will is from you. So often it happens within our lives when we get faced with a, with a trial, with some sort of bala that comes our way, we instantly turn against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, we sort of don't think of Allah as being our aid. Whereas Allah says in the Holy Quran, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْهِمْ مِنِ الْقَمْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَفْسِ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ It's a very common ayat used especially during the time of Muharram. And Allah will test man through من الخوف والجوع through fear and hunger وَنَقْسِ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ through loss of wealth والثمرات through fruits i.e. their children والأنفس and through themselves وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ and glad tidings to those that are patient الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةً they are those ones that when presented with a musiba, with a sorrow, with a bala قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ الرَّاجِعُونَ they are the ones that say إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ الرَّاجِعُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests mankind on these various various levels so these wars, these trials, these calamities what are they there for? They are to test you. What for? In order for you to display satisfaction and pleasure within the divine will and in order for you to display patience. What is the result of it? Spiritual development. Spiritual development. Spiritual upliftment. Sayr suluk As is known in the language of the Urafa, the Gnostics. But this is not something I want to get into, you know. Um, all the spirituality and things like this the main parts of the, the spirituality and all of these things they can be gained from the du'as of Ali Muhammad remember this thing there is no need for us to be looking at, at least on the basic level on our level to be start looking for shaykhs and shuyukhs and start walking around in libas and all sorts of these things when the du'as of Ali Muhammad are the first stepping stone towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People like Imam Khomeini rahmatullah he says that I will recommend people to recite things like Munajat Sha'baniya. Munajat Sha'baniya. Ziyarat Ashura, Dua Abi Hamda Timari. Certain du'as that we recite constantly, constantly, but to us they have no worth we haven't had the opportunity to ponder over them but yet we look for azkar zikrs to do 512 times ya ta'ali or 313 times ya da'imul ya fadli al bariya ya ya fatahu 120 times and it will give you this magical power we're not into magical powers the first step is ubudiyya it is servitude towards Allah. First you submit, and then everything else comes. First you enter into Islam, and then Iman comes. And then there are 14 stages 
before one reaches the realm that is known as Khulus. 14 stages. Islam-e Asfar, Iman-e Asfar. Islam-e Akbar, Iman-e Akbar. Islam-e A'adham, Iman-e A'adham. These are all levels where one progresses, learns about the deen, implements it, enters. Goes to learn a higher knowledge about the deen, implements it, enters into another realm. Then goes back again to Islamic Akbar, Islamic Aqbar, and starts learning more and deeper. And then once that is sat within his heart, he is acted upon that, then he enters into Iman Aqbar. Then after that, you start the Hijrah, Hijrah to Subra, Hijrah to Kubra, Hijrah to Udrama. The migrations towards Allah. Once he has completed his migrations, then he enters the realms of jihad. Jihad al Asfar, Jihad al Jihad al Asfar, Jihad al Akbar, Jihad al A'lam. After completing Jihad al A'lam, he enters into the realm of Qulus. Ikhlas. It's a word that we throw around. Ikhlas. Oh, he did this with love, Qulus. He did it with sincerity. The realm of sincerity is. 13 realms before that must be transversed before one enters the realm of sincerity and then from there there are other realms Fana, baka. all of those different realms but the thing is you have to start from the basics you start building from the basics tazkiyah to nafs purification of the soul and then we start to ascend towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is only once we've laid those foundations do we ascend. Not through Askar, and these things come later. The first step is this. The first step is to actually make Allah an integral part of my life. I often forget who Allah is. I often forget my uh, duties towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Things go bad in my life. When we go back to those tests, things go bad. In my life, we forget, we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So many mercies are bestowed upon us, but yet we forget. We read Dua Muhammad al Thimani, Alhamdulillah, Nadi, Ad'uhu fi yuji buni. All praise be to Allah who gives answers to me whenever I pray to Him. When He come to Bati and Heena Yad'uni. Although I am slow whenever he invites me. He answers me instantly. But yet when he orders me to do something, I'm slow to do it. Alhamdulillah, ladhi as'aluhu for yu'atini. All praise be to Allah, alone who gives me whenever I ask him. وَإِكُنْتُ بَخِيلًا حِينَ يَسْتَقْبِضُنِي But yet when he asks me, I become close-fisted, I become miserly. I don't want to live in his way. This is wonderful. Dua iftitah. Sha'ala only a couple of months ago has gone past. Dua iftitah. Recited it every single night. Alhamdulillah, ladhi yujibuni heena unadi. Praise be to Allah, who gives answers to me whenever I call him. He covers up my shortcomings. He answers whenever I call to him. Yet, I disobey him. He gives me large parts of his bounties. But yet, I do not show him gratitude. I do not show him thankfulness. This is our station that we often forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, take the example, take for example, Dari that my Lord, I have oppressed myself. And I have been audacious in my ignorance. 
And the only thing that has kept me going, that has kept me alive, is your constant remembrance of me and your mercy upon me. Even though I've committed all of those sins. This is the first realm. This is the first stage. Getting to that level where I'm in love with Allah. I don't become despondent. When he doesn't answer me, I'm doing dua constantly, constantly, constantly doing dua. And I'm like, Ya Allah, why are you not answering my dua? I've got this problem, I've got this problem, I've got this problem. Why are you not answering me? Are we, we often become despondent. And there's a beautiful hadith from the sixth Imam Imam Salih, sallallahu alayhi says that uh, when there is a supplicant that is constantly, constantly crying towards Allah, Allah hears his dua. He hears his dua. This is something that we've learned since we were children. Allah hears his dua, but does not answer. He tells the malaika, I've accepted his dua, but stop. Don't go to him just yet. Delay a little bit. Saying what? I love to hear his cries towards me. If I gave it to him, he would walk away now. His remembrance of me would cease. But I love to hear this constant remembrance. Because why? It is for his betterment. It is for his betterment. Allah doesn't just say that I am more kareem, I am more raheem than a mother to her newborn child. Everything in our lives, it points to that rahmah that He has bestowed upon us. He enjoys it when the slave constantly knocks at his door. But yet at the same time, he despises it when his slave falls at the feet of another man to ask. On one hand, we've got, you know, in dua, Ya man yuhibbu ilhaahul muliheen. Oh, the one who loves to hear the one that cries out to him. But on the other hand, he's saying, I despise the one who goes and asks from others other than me. He goes to their hands and he falls at the feet of men for his problems. Yet he forgets me. This again boils down to that lack of understanding, that lack of faith that we have within Allah. That we think that we can turn to mankind or turn to fellow men to help us and at the same time now don't get me wrong later on we will come into this but I, um, as to how we can go to to help um, go to man and then also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but this concept of only falling at the feet of men and forgetting Allah this is what is hated there are many aspects of dua there are many aspects of in about 30 minutes and I've just got past my introduction. <laughs> Inshallah, we'll try and wrap up. Right, so there are many aspects of dua. This was just an introduction to how one should perceive dua. The prerequisites are only a few, but the aspects of dua are, are many. In the time that I have, I'll highlight three essential prerequisites that we get from the teachers of akhlaq. The first one is the mindset of dua. When I do the dua, what is the mindset? Am I, is the aim of my dua to gain material things? Am I aiming to gain something? You know, I need a car. I need to, I don't know, go on holiday somewhere. People ask these dua. We are we are constantly embroiled within the the materialistic worlds. 
surrounded by the realms of multiplicity, surrounded by all of these various hijabs that are over our eyes, we then continue to focus upon the, the physical ones, the, the things that I need to pray for, like, I know, my car, my 2-1, or my first, depending on, you know, where you're aiming, yeah? But all sorts of a'mal, 40 days of Ziyad Ashura, so I get first. 40 days of Ziyad Ashura, so I, I get out of my economic situation. 40 days of Ziyad Ashura, so I can get rid of this problem that's been bugging me for ages. This, there are people against me. There's this, there's that. I can't seem to uh, get ahead in life. People are pulling me back. People are spreading rumors about me. All of these things in our life. We're constantly thinking, we're constantly doing, and every time we raise our hands for dua, Ya Allah, I'm ill, I've got this problem, I've got that problem, everything is physical. Madiyat, everything is physical. It's, it's the physical realm that we're asking for. But the teachers of akhlaq, they say, go to another. They said, ask for the, the betterment of your inside, to you, of your ruh. You ask, oh Allah, give me the presence of heart in my namaz. Give me that hate towards sin. Give me the ability to wait for fajr. Give me the ability to wait for salat al -layl. Give me the ability to actually love worshipping you. These are the things that we should be working towards. Because he will give, regardless of whether or not you supplicate to him. The dua of Rajab. Ya man yu'ti man sa'ala. Or the one who gives to the one who supplicates. Wa ya man yu'ti man lam yas'anhu wa man lam ya'rifhu. Ta'annuna minhu rahmah. And all the one who gives to those that do not supplicate and do not even acknowledge his existence out of his mercy whether or not you ask these physical these material things will be given to you he is razik he will give you your risk so use that time to ask for something more that's something that will help you to develop yourself spiritually because once you've developed yourself spiritually then everything in the physical realm all of these other things will fall into place the first step is that tazkiyat and that's the purification of the soul but make sure you know, if, but that's not to say that you can't pray for these things that are material <clears throat> of course you know that it's human nature but sometimes we have to try and look for something slightly deeper a deeper understanding and when we pray for the physical things one of the actual you know aspects of dua one of the rules of dua is do not pray for something extraordinary something that's not within the rules of physics i'll give you an example i have from an alim um this quite a it's quite a funny one this alim uh, this person comes to this alim and says to him you know i want to uh, have a child it's okay it says uh okay uh, have you done this du'a? Have you done this du'a? He says, yes, I've done this du'a. I've been to this zareeh. I've uh, recited this du'a. I've, I've recited this many times. I've had water and drank it. I've, I've you know, wore this ta'wiz. Yeah, all sorts of wacky things that we have within uh, this realm. And I, yeah, I've been to everyone. I've even been to the wake doctors, you know, everything. But just, I can't seem to have a child. Alim says, really? He says, so what about this? No, I've done that. This, I've done that. He goes, okay, there is one. Take this uh, ta'wiz and tell your wife to wear it. He says, wife. So what wife? <laughs> he says, what wife? He says, uh, so you're not married? He says, no. And you, so how are you expecting to have a child? He says, I don't have a wife, I don't have a partner, but you, Alims, you will sit on the member and you will say, he is Khalid, 
He can create everything that he wants. He is the one that gave Maryam a child without a father. Why can he not give me a child without a mother? So, so these, these sort of extraordinary du'as, they don't work. So you know, it has to be within the laws of physics. You, know, you, get, you get all sorts of people. You know, I've met people who claim to get text messages from the imam. But that's, that's, trust me. I have uh, some characters. So <laughs> you, get, you get all sorts of people, but remember that, that spirituality, that development of the self. So the first one is the mindset of the heart. What am I actually asking for when I suffer? The second is the, the type or the Actually, there's one thing that um, that needs to be uh, noted here. Is that, you know, sometimes when a person reaches those realms, the, those realms of understanding and, you know, has entered that level of khulus, they no longer want the, the madiyat, those things that are in front of them. For example, take the example um, of the magicians of Pharaoh. This is one example I wanted to give you, and I've actually uh, forgotten to. But take that example of the magicians of Pharaoh. The magicians of Pharaoh, when they see that the Asa of Nabi Musa has turned to a snake, they say, we believe in the Lord of Harun and Musa. Pharaoh says, if you accept their faith, I will cut off your hands and your feet, and I will crucify you upon the date palm trees. And they say, you know, we don't care, we've accepted this faith. When he, when he starts to punish them, they cry out the dua that they ask for. They're, they're saying, my Lord, give us patience and count us within the Muslims. Even at that point, not my Lord, you know, help me out of this situation. No, give us sabr to face this trial that has come your way. Look at the Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. When she accepts the deen, Fir'aun drives nails through her body to kill her. They lay her down and they drive huge nails through her body. She dies. There, but the dua of Asiya was within the Holy Quran. Which is what, my Lord, give me a bait, or give me a house within Jannah. Give me a house within Jannah. See, he's showing me his watch, he's saying, time's up. So, inshallah, I'll try and uh, to wrap it up. Give me that house in Jannah, give me that nearness. They, they've seen the reality now, and they don't want anything from this dunya. Now they're, they're desiring the akhirah. One of the teachers of Akhlaq and Qum said something very beautifully. He said that I can teach you the Isma'a'u, the, the Isma'a'u, one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa the hidden names of Allah, I can teach you them. The Isma'a'u that will give you the ability to look into the hearts of men. I will teach you, I can teach you the Isma'a'u to give you the ability to see on the other side of the wall. What good will it do for you? He says, tell first step is enter, make Allah enter into your heart. Enter into this realm of love within Allah, then all of these things, they won't matter to you. They will come, but you won't use them. But the first step is that realm. That's la mahdud. When we look at the look at Allah, the characteristics of Allah, the sifat is salbiya. Well, those sifat that he cannot possess, but one of them is makan, he cannot be restricted by time and space. But that la mahdu, the one that cannot be contained, the one place where he comes and descends is the heart of Mu'min. He can sit and he will descend onto the heart of a Mu'min, but yet this Mu'min does not understand his worth, his level, his greatness, that you can contain 
than beneficent. That's one thing. The dua. The second one is that sometimes our du'as do not reach, and this is the last point that I'll leave you with, um, I think. Yes, it will be. I, I'll leave you with this point and then I won't. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that'll be enough for today. Um, so this, this point is that sometimes that our du'as do not reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have in various other du'as from Ahlul Bayt, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min du'a la yasma. Uh, min du'a illa yasma. That I seek refuge from that du'a that is not heard by you. Why are these du'as not heard? Why does he choose not to listen? Sometimes the du'as, they are restricted by our hijab, the hijabs that we have created through our constant sitting. If I was to shut off this, shut this door, block all the windows and everything and then lit a candle in here, nowhere else, or turn on all of these lights, no one would benefit. It would stay within. Why? Because there are hijabs, there are curtains, there are restrictions within the way. But once these are removed, the light shines. The same way with the heart. When we have these curtains over our heart, our du'as do not reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa ibn Agran is coming out from his house. Nabi Musa. Yeah. Father's name is Imran. Musa ibn Imran. So uh, Nabi Musa is coming out from his house. He sees a man sitting there and he's crying and he's wailing. And he's doing du'a, just weeping and weeping and asking Allah for his du'a. Nabi Musa looks at him, feels sorry for this guy. So when he goes to speak to Allah in the Mikat, he says, Ya Allah, I saw this man. He was constantly crying for you. He was crying. He was crying in fear for you and asking for his du'a. Won't you listen to his supplication? Allah says, Musa, there are three reasons why I will not listen to his supplications. I'll leave you with these three. Three reasons why du'a is not accepted. Why Allah does not listen to the du'a of a person. He says, why? He says, يَدْعُونِي He's calling onto me بِلِسَانٍ بَذِيْءٍ وَقَلْبٍ غَيْرٍ نَقِيٍ وَنِيَّةٍ غَيْرِ صَادِقًا He is calling unto me, Musa, he is calling with me بِلِسَانٍ بَذِيْءٍ With a bad tongue. This man in his normal life, he swears. He does not show akhlaq towards other people. His tongue is rude. And yet he expects me to listen to his du'a when he comes in front of me. Rabbana, Rabbana, Ya Ilahi wa Sayyidi. Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi. But yet, when he's away from the Musalla, away from problems, his tongue is like this. وَقَلْبٍ غَيْرِ النَّقِي And his heart is not clean. His heart is filled with pride, with jealousy, with anger, with hatred. These are the diseases of the soul. Jealousy, pride, hatred, anger. These are the diseases that will stop us from progressing. Laziness. There are certain things that we, we don't think, well, it, it can't be a disease of the soul. Laziness. The laziness that stops me from rising to praise Allah. The, la the laziness that stops me from rising to pray in Nawazi Fajr. Stops me from doing the extra at the Riyadh. This is that laziness. There are various. I don't have time to go into them. So he says, his heart is not clean. It has diseases within his soul. Within his heart. And he's not trying to cleanse them. This is the important part. Not trying to. They're there. But at the same time, you know what? We're just going to do dua and leave it at that. And then the final one, his niyat is not true. His niyat, his intention is not. His mind is wandering elsewhere. And we often do this. When we come to ask for dua, we don't have tawakkul in Allah. It says, Ya Allah, I have this problem in my life. I have about a week to solve it. 
if, and in the back of my mind I'm thinking, if you can't solve it, then I'll know a brother who can hook me up. Yeah? This is, this is what I think, right? I know a brother that can hook me up. Ya Allah, I've got no money, but I know. This is a guy who said he'll sort me out and then next year, or next month I can sort him out or whenever I get my loan installed. No tawakkul on Allah. Not having any of that, that firm, you know, uh, remembrance and that uh, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always at the back of my mind. So I leave you with that. Um, inshallah, we get another opportunity or whatever, I'll, I'll try and uh, expand on those further. Brothers and sisters, use this time wisely. This time at university, where you're away from everyone, you know, there's a lot more distractions, but at the same time, there are less distractions. Use this time to better yourself spiritually. And when you better yourself spiritually, when you when you start to purify your soul from these diseases, you start to really enter into those realms of actually wanting to do ibadat of Allah, then everything else that you desire will come. But the first step is to let go of these materialistic desires that we have and submit ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Use the Ahlul Bayt society as your platform to go forward. Don't use it as a platform to water down the beliefs of Ahl al-Bayt. You know, often we have it that the Ahl al-Bayt society, we're in an academic environment, so we're not going to recite salawat. And you know what? It's okay if we have like a, like a mixed gathering and stuff. It's fine. It's university. It's haram. It's simple as that. There is no ifs, there are no buts about it. It's haram. Yes, if there is a spe specific reason for it, not just we're going to have a social, we're going to go out and we're going to have a social, we're going to have a dinner and ya Allah, you know what we'll do, we'll take the brothers along with us, we'll take the sisters along with us and this is our social, this is how. Do not defame the Ahlul Bayt through our actions, keep our actions in line with the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt and we will progress. This society will progress and we ourselves will progress further and closer towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive the sins of our parents. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala those of our parents that are alive, give them long lives. Those of our parents that have left this world, give them a place next to Muhammad in Jannah. Oh Allah, those who are ill, give them shifa'ah. Those who are in debt, clear their debts. O oh Allah, those who are in education, make them successful. Keep our ulama and our malaj at the head of our institutions and hasten the reappearance of the Imam of our time and allow us to be amongst his true muntadirin, his true awaiters. Um, I know I've taken up a, a lot of time, so um, we'll have a few questions if there are some. If not, then I'll uh, then you will go. Thank you, Brother Nadim, for a very inspiring speech. <coughs> uh, do we have any questions from anyone in the crowd?
uh, also in next week we have another lecture here, same time, same place, uh, with Brother Hassan Punjwani, and the topic is on BB Fatima and Islam. And so there'll be further details on the Facebook group. And those of you who haven't joined the Facebook group, please do so.